everybody. How are you? God bless you. Ah, today is the day. Today is the day I'm going to finally share my testimony. It's long, which is part of the reason why I did not make this video before, but the Lord has been putting it on my heart. A lot of you guys have been reaching out to me asking, Anna, what is your testimony? Um, glory to God. It's amazing. And it's quite long. So here we go. Here we go. This is it. Um, finally. Okay. So praise God. Well, Lord, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you remind me of every single little detail and I not, and I not miss a single word of your testimony, Lord God, of the testimony that you so graciously allowed me to have in such mercy, Father God. I pray for everyone watching. May you bless them. May you reach the lost, God, through this video as well. May it open and tickle some ears to follow you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead the way. Amen. Glorify your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, there's kind of a lot to get to. So I'm going to jump into some of the background story of myself. So kind of have a little bit of perspective and understanding of where I was before I found the Lord, which wasn't pretty, <laughs> but um, yeah, well, basically, okay, well, I'll just say this. So I, I, my mom got saved when we came to America. So actually I'll back it up even more. Why not? So I was born in the Soviet Union. I moved here when I was four with my family, my mom, my dad, my sister, and my dad is Jewish an atheist for now, hopefully. I, I, know, I know that won't last because the Lord told me, but um, he's an atheist right now. And my mom was an atheist as well. She got born again when she got to America, probably around, I think I was five or something like that. And um, so she got saved. And so she took me to church and my sister to church every single Sunday. We were going to a religious church, an Orthodox Christian church, um, I didn't like it. I remember going every single Sunday, kind of dragging my feet, not wanting to go and, you know, going with her anyway. I had no choice. I was too small. But then when I turned 12, I had a little bit of a choice, which I don't know why my mom let me do this, but I decided not to go to church anymore. I was like, oh, I don't want to go anymore, mom. And my dad left at the time. My mom and my dad divorced, which was very tough, uh, really, really hard on me. I made a lot of mistakes after that, not having a father figure around. So if dad, if you're watching, I love you. I forgive you. We're, we're, we're in really good. Like, I love my dad. We're very close, but I was 12 when he left and I was 12 when I left the church. Um, and, and I, you know, I was good. Not, no one's good because we're not, no one is good except the father. Um, but I really started to lose myself. I think when I was in my early twenties, when my high school sweetheart left me and I was heartbroken kind of things went down from there. Um, but yeah, I'll get back to that. So I was 12. I stopped going to church and I, you know, I believed in Jesus when I was younger, but I didn't like the whole religious aspect of church. And that's exactly, um, what shocked me when I found the Lord, because I realized it's not about having a religion. It's not about the tradition of going to church. It's about a relationship with Jesus that gets you saved. I didn't know that it's a personal relationship that came later. So I'm 12. I leave the church. Um, you know, my mom was young in the faith, so she didn't know to what to say to me. She didn't know what to teach me. She didn't know how to, um, get me to go back to church. And if she would have forced me to go to church, I would have rebelled even more. So on the one hand, it's, Oh, it, it's hard to say. I, I wish I knew Jesus when I was little and like stayed with him because I would have not made so many mistakes, but those mistakes are part of my testimony that I'm going to share now. So from there, um, um, yeah, I'm in my twenties. I start playing poker for fun as a hobby when I'm actually, when I was 18. And then I told my high school sweetheart, I actually said, I was like, when I get older, I want to play poker for a living and I want to be on Survivor because I just got into Survivor at that time. Survivor, the television show, CBS. And I remember him telling me, Anna, you're never going to get on Survivor. You're never going to play poker. Get over yourself. It's not going to happen. And sure enough, a few years later, you know, I ended up playing poker for a living and um, I got on Survivor. <laughs> I was the first female poker player on Survivor, which was 
which was cool for me at the time. Again, living in the world, I was like, wow, this is like my dream and my two dreams coming true. And amen, you know, I didn't say amen, but I was like, yay, awesome. So, um, I po played poker for most of my for, for, for most of that time, for six years, like I said, it supported me through college. It paid for my books, it paid for my rent, it paid for my stuff, my skis, everything that I was doing. Um, it, it, it was a hobby at first. It was a very lucrative hobby. I remember when I turned 21, the first thing I did was I got a car to drive to Atlantic City. Again, I'm living in New York. Um, I'm actually still here. I am still living in New York. I will be leaving New York uh, within, I, within a year. The Lord told me I'm leaving soon. So Hey man, I have to sell a few more properties. I'm, I'm a real estate broker here, so I'm going to sell it and go and see wherever the Lord takes me. I'm not sure where it's going to be. It might be Texas. It might be Washington State. It might be Wyoming. Uh, it might be Florida. Wherever he leads, I'm open. It might be, I don't know, it might be goodness where. I don't know where, 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 where I'm going to go, but anyway, that's besides the story. So, wow, there's so much. Um, so yeah, I was playing poker full time and I loved it. It was fun. I was living my dream, but at the same time, I mean, the, the, the job poker became a job and it, um, it was very stressful, a lot of anxiety. I was dating my second love, my second boyfriend, um, you know, main boy, you know, I had a few relationships between them, whatever, but this one was like a, you know, legit one that I was in, in again for the next, for another four years, well, six years and four years. And six years of my high school sweetheart and then four years with this guy. And he's a great guy. Um, if you're watching, hi, God bless you. Hope you're doing well. I still pray for you because he doesn't know the Lord. Um, great guy though. Great family. I love his family. I'll, I'll stop there because a lot of people know who he is in the poker world. So anyway, great guy. But, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I found the Lord. So obviously him being a liberal He's very left-leaning, um, atheist, very stubborn atheist. And here I am, you know, finding the Lord and, um, you know, being conservative. So I, I went too far. Let me back up a little bit more. So I'm playing poker for a living. Um, and it's so funny when the, whatever, this is a side note, but poker community is like, you didn't make that much money. I didn't make that much money. I, I played mostly cash. It supported me through those years. I played a lot of tournaments online. I won a decent amount online um, and it was helping me get through and I was learning and I was, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a professional, but I was definitely playing 24 seven as much as I could, learning as much as I could. And I was so obsessed. I was so addicted. I was so obsessed. I never considered it gambling. Um, I always considered just like most poker players, gambling is when you're playing blackjack, when you're playing uh, Fakrat, whatever it's called. Those are gambling games, but when poker you're playing against, um, your, your opponent is not the house, your opponents are the people at the table. So it's a game of psychology, it's a game of outsmarting people, and I love games, I love game theory. I loved learning from my boyfriend at the time who was a professional, who is a professional, was wonderful at the game, and I was just soaking up as much information, knowledge as I could. So again, I'm an atheist, um, playing poker, I was going to go to medical school I was going to go to medical school. I was studying for my MCAT um, out of, right out of college. And I decided to take a year to see what happens in poker. So I put, put medical school on hold to play poker. And I, again, had a lot of fun doing it. It was stressful, whatever. And then a few years, and then a few years into it, um, I decided to give Survivor a shot. I've always wanted to be on the show. I thought it was also a wonderful game theory it's a game theory show. So it very much mirrored what I loved in poker. It's, it's a game theory. It's psychology. There's a beginning game, middle game, end game. That stuff really intrigued me. And that's why I loved Survivor and loved poker. So I tried out for Survivor, which is a testimony in itself because I tried out and um, let's just say my interview went really bad. I butchered the interview. I get really nervous in front of a camera, uh, like in video, which you can tell sometimes in my, you know, Bible studies I do the first five minutes, I'm really awkward. And I sometimes even forget to pray because I just, I, I get really awkward in front of a video camera, but you know, pictures are easy, whatever. Point is, is that I, I froze in front of the camera 
and uh, I was at a live casting call in Caesars Casino in Atlantic City for Survivor. I was on a six hour line and you know, the line was just, it was a long line. And let's just say I got in front of the camera, I froze, I maybe said a few sentences of like, I should be on Survivor because I play poker and you know, it's game theory game and, and I would be good on Survivor. And then I just froze. And uh, I was in tears when I walked away, like full blown tears, hysterically crying, got home, was upset. I was, a bunch of poker guys were waiting and just like hanging out playing poker on their computers. And here I am like, ah, I just wasted six hours of my life. Anyway, a month later, I got a phone call from Survivor asking to do another interview. And uh, I was shocked because I butchered the interview. You know, this is God's grace. When God has a will for your life, even though, even if the enemy tries to take that away, or even if you yourself to take, you know, are, are kind of, you're not getting there. You know, it's the grace of God that comes in and says, no, this is my will for you. Um, it was literally, it was literally God's grace that I even got a call back because again, most of the people don't ever get a call back. And I was, they were, I was in line with people telling me that they never uh, got a phone call, never got an email, never got a call back. And some of them have been trying out for 10 years, like 15 years, like crazy stuff. So I totally wasn't expecting it. So I was floored when they did call me and went through the interview process. I'm not really allowed to talk about that whole casting process since you signed an NDA, but it was a long process. And I got on the show, filmed the show. That was fun, really great. Got to challenge my body fast. I wasn't praying then, but I was certainly fasting. And, um, you, you know, the show's out there, season 32. Uh, met some great people. It was a great experience. And um, people asked me if I would do it again. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to do it again. I don't care to do it again. I don't think I would do it again because <laughs> there's a lot of people there that don't like me. Um, being a Christian, being conservative, being a Trump supporter, not really liked in that field, but anyway, God bless them anyway, which I'll actually make a video of that. This, you know, how, how to deal with slander, lies, libel, all that good stuff that is coming for everyone. And the Lord promised that we're going to experience persecution. So, um, so I film survivor. I get back home. I was living with my boyfriend at the time in New Jersey. And this is when everything started shifting in my life. I, all of a sudden, I lost my passion for poker. My passion for Survivor was gone. It was like I was cleansed of my addiction. I didn't see it as an addiction, but my obsession with Survivor, learning and studying, learning and studying and playing and just soaking up information and all of that. You know, I was tucked away from the world just playing poker for six years, you know? And um, I lost my passion for poker and Survivor. It was so weird. It was so weird. And I know it was the Lord. He cleansed me. Even before I knew him, he cleansed me of my addiction to poker and Survivor. And all of a sudden, I'm with my boyfriend and he's, you know, playing poker all day. And I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't care for it. I don't want to. I don't want to open my computer. And when I did open my computer, I lost like, gloriously. Like, I mean, I kept losing. There were hands I was not supposed to lose, you know, literally. And he saw it. He saw it. He even mentioned it. He was like, how are you losing these hands? I, I you know, straight flush over, you know, quads over a straight flush. I mean, just crazy things. No matter what I did, I kept losing. If I opened up that computer, I was losing and losing and losing hands I wasn't supposed to. Big pots, you know, three, four thousand, whatever. And um, even in person, and it was just really bad. And I was like, oh, I hate this game. I don't want to play this anymore. And he was shocked. He said, he was like, what's going on with you? Why, what's happening with you? You don't want to play poker. The moment you play poker, this crazy stuff is happening. Like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't even want to play. And that sparked off, this was 2015. So I filmed Survivor 2015. I'm back now, this is May, 2015. So I filmed in March, I'm back home in May. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm with my ex and I don't wanna play. I don't wanna play for some reason, for some weird reason, I have a fascination with 
studying politics. And this is, you know, right before June 2015 is when um, President Trump announced he was going to run for office. I think it's June 20, 26, 2015. I might be wrong, but I think it was June he, he announced. And I had a weird fascination with watching politics, learning politics. I started ordering a lot of books. Again, I was apolitical my whole entire life. Even though I was born in the Soviet Union and I knew that Marxism and communism is evil, I was never political. I voted for President Obama in 2008 like a dummy, but I was excited to see, you know, a black president. I was excited for, um, you know, I was excited to vote for the first time. And I, I voted for him and I was super proud. And that was the only time I voted. I didn't vote for him actually 2012 because I, some of the things he was doing was very socialist driven. And I saw it and I realized it and I thought, wait a second, I, socialism I know is evil, communism is evil. You're acting a little too weird. So I, I didn't vote for him the second time, but the first time I did, again, apolitical, didn't know what was going on in the world, happy to see a black president and all that. And, and, um, and, and, and yeah, and so then here I am studying politics, reading books, ordering books, listening to Ben Shapiro, <laughs> Milo, I mean, a bunch of guys and, and gals um, talking about politics and it really intrigued me. And I thought, Hmm, so that sparked again, five or six, five and a half months of intense digging, intense researching, reading. I got, I went, I, I went down the rabbit hole. I went down the rabbit hole of like sex trafficking is real. Child trafficking is real. That Satanism is real. That Satanists are real, that they worship Satan. And there are, you know, ex Satanists talking about God and this and that. And I was like, what? Say what? I was thinking if, and I remember, th I remember thinking this, I was like, if, wait a second, I'm an atheist, like, wait a second, if Satan is real, that means that God is real. And if God is real, I don't want to follow Satan. I want to follow God because I have a, a deep love for God as, as a child growing up in church, but I just didn't think he was real. So I'm like, wait a second, if God is real, I want to follow him. I don't want to follow the devil. I want to follow God. So I became, I guess, you know, open-minded ears to hear. And through these five months, again, my boyfriend at the time was like, what's wrong with you? You're not playing poker. You're like reading politics. And he's very liberal. And so he's like, what are you doing? Like, what are you saying? Um, like, why are you watching? Why are you watching what you're watching? What are you doing? And, um, and then there came a day where I was obviously going down the rabbit hole gets you really anxious. And that's why I'm careful with what I listen to. I'm careful with what I hear. I'm very careful, first of all, not to hear the enemy's voice of his plans. I love to hear the word of God and what he has to say, whether in the secret closet or whether in his word. But I didn't want to hear anything from, uh, you know, I learned to, 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 to care, be careful with what I listened to because it was getting me very anxious. It was getting me very depressed and I've never been depressed before. And it came a day in those, in, in the end of that five and a half months where I had a breakdown. I had a breakdown. I did. It was my first Hopefully my last breakdown. I went upstairs. I locked the door behind me. I got on my knees. I will never forget this day. I cried out. I mean, I was crying out quietly, but I was just like, I was, man, I was broken. I was done. I was lost. I was broken. I was confused. I'm not happy where I am. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I'm not supposed to be here. I don't want to play poker. I'm having, you know, fighting. We're, I keep fighting with my, with, with that, with that ex, with that boyfriend at the time, we were just butting heads and we disagree on so much right now. It's political right now. I'm a conservative, but again, I'm not a believer yet, but we keep clashing and I'm not happy with him. And, you know, I'm not happy with my life. What am I doing with my life? I'm lost. I'm broken. What do I do? So it was literally what I said. I was crying out. I have never cried like that in my life. I mean, if someone, it, it was an ugly cry. It was, I'm sure it was an ugly cry. And you know what? I poured my heart out and I don't care. <laughs> um, praise God. That was such a moment in my life where I needed to do it. And what I did is I begged for God. I cried on my knees and I was like, I asked three things. 
I said, God, if you're real, I'm starting to believe you're real. Show me you're real. I want to know you. I said, are you real? Two, I said, I'm lost and I'm broken. What do I do with my life? I don't know what to do with my life. And I, number three, I said, tell me the truth of the world because I feel like I'm being lied to. I feel like the media is lying to me. I feel like the newspapers are lying to me. I, I feel like something's wrong, that we're not being told the whole truth and I wanna know what's going on. And I cried out. I, I was probably there for like an hour, just sobbing and crying. I mean, I barely could open my eyes when I was done. Again, I'm on my knees crying and just like, Lord, are you real? Tell me the truth for the world. What do I do with my life? I'm lost, I'm broken, I don't know what to do. I'm not happy. What do I do? What job do I do? What's my job? Like, what am I doing here? Get me out of here. I don't know what to do. And for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Because here's what happened. I didn't get an answer right away. It took about two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, I was invited to, to do a reunion, not a reunion, sorry, to do a, um, a high school tour, a high school and college tour in Nebraska. This is 2016. I was invited to do a high school uh, college tour to talk about, you know, with a bunch of survivors and big brothers, like a bunch of reality, you know, reality TV stars to talk about drugs and how bad they are and talk about bullying and all this stuff. It was really great. It was a fantastic tour. And one of the guys on the tour, he's actually a reality TV personality. You would know who he is. Um, he is a fireball Christian, just a beautiful person. He knows who he is. I won't mention his name. You would definitely know who he is. And um, he came up to me and he was like, um, he was like, I, I know I'm here to meet you. And I was like, what? Now, again, we're friends. Like we, we, I've actually, I've never met him before that. We became friendly on the trip. We're still friends now. He's an amazing guy. And he's like, um, I, I'm here to meet you. He's like, this is going to sound really weird, Anna, but God uses me as a messenger. I'm a Christian and, I, and, and I have a message for you. He said, I don't, I feel compelled, compelled to tell you this, by the way, side note also, um, I was supposed to go on the first trip, which was in Florida, which was like right before or right after I had that breakdown crying moment. And here's how sneaky the devil is. The devil didn't allow me to come. My, he, he was my boyfriend at the time. He begged me not to go on this trip to Florida. And by the way, this guy was supposed to be there and I was supposed to meet him and talk about the Lord. And he told me there's something missing in Florida. You were supposed to be in Florida and I was supposed to go last second. And I've never canceled an event. I've never canceled anything I've ever promised. I keep my word. And um, I was, I, the, that last second, right before my flight, the guy I was dating was begging me not to go. He's like, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. To the point where I was doubting myself and I decided not to fly out. And so I was supposed to be in Florida and he was supposed to be there and, and tell me about God. So anyway, fast forward, I was shocked when this person invited me to go to, to another trip to, to Nebraska. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I missed the first one. I'll absolutely be in the second one. So I was compelled. I had to go to Nebraska. And even though, again, I was being told, don't go, don't go and security, whatever. I don't know, right from his side, but, um, you know, we were just so attached to each other, but I decided to go to Nebraska, thank God, because this guy was there again. And he told me, he's like, you were supposed to go to Florida and you didn't go. The enemy doesn't want you to hear this, but I'm gonna tell you this because you're here now. Uh, you have felt the Holy Spirit before. I said, what? Again, I'm an atheist. I have my ears open because I said, God, if you're real, show me you're real. And here is this atheist, uh, here I am as an atheist with ears open, ready to hear, waiting for God to tell me he's real. I'm just waiting. Again, this is two weeks in already. And he's telling me that God is real, that um, I'm here to tell you God is real. You've been asking if God is real. He's real. Jesus is real. He's the Messiah. He said, you felt the Holy Spirit before. And I said, no, I didn't. He said, yes, you did. And I said, no, I didn't. I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, yes, you did. Think back. 
Because the spirit of God is telling me that you felt the Holy Spirit. Think. And I said, well, something happened to me when I was 18 in Jerusalem. Oh, that's my belly. I'm hungry. I'm uh, kind of fasting. Um, yeah, my belly. So ignore that. <laughs> um, I said, something happened to me when I was 18 in Jerusalem. He said, what? He said, tell me about it fascinating. I haven't told anyone at that time what happened to me in Jerusalem because it was so profound. It was so unbelievable. It was the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. It was the most amazing day of my life. Um, I, and I don't even know how to explain it. it. It's hard to explain in human words what happened and what I felt, the emotions I felt. And I'm going to be raw and honest with you. I mean, as I've been about what I was feeling, what I was thinking and all of that. So here I am. Okay. So again, he's telling me something happened to you. Tell me what happened to you. And I'm thinking back and I'm like, okay, 18, when I was in Jerusalem, something happened that I've never known what happened. You're like, you're like, Anna, get it out already. Okay. So I'm sorry. It takes me some time because it was, there was a lot. Um, when I was 18, I was in high school, uh, I was in high school, my senior year and with a bunch of my friends, we got together to do a birthright trip, uh, to Israel and birthright trip is a free trip. Students can take to Israel or students or any adults, I think before 26, I think it is that can take a trip to Israel for free. Um, you know, my last name is Jewish, Chayith, Hebrew, Kate, you know, Kate, and, um, and even though I've been to Israel many times because my aunt lives there, my dad's sister lives there with my cousins. Um, hey guys, if you're watching, I love you. So I go back to visit ever so often, but anyway, I went to visit when I was 18 on this birthright trip with a bunch of friends and funny enough, speaking about fast, funny enough, the Lord forced a fast on me, even though I had no idea what it was, he forced a fast on me. And basically about two or three days into the 10 day tour. Cause again, we're touring all over Israel. We're going to Jerusalem. We went to Nazareth. We, I'm sorry, we didn't go to Nazareth. Uh, we went to Jerusalem, you know, we went to um, just everywhere, the Dead Sea. I mean, uh, Elijah's, uh, you know, mountain. And we, we just went everywhere. It's not coming to mind right now because I don't think that's, I'm not supposed to go. There. So let's just, anyway. So I got sick about the second or the third day of the trip, really, really sick. I couldn't eat anything. Never, it's never happened to me before like this. I mean, I was really, really sick. I, any, I could barely even drink water, um, but I did drink water. I remember drinking tea, but any food I put in my mouth instantly wanted to vomit out literally it touched my tongue. It wasn't even in my belly, it touched my tongue. I would want to spit it out. I got so nauseous. I was on this fast for like five or six days. And I remember going from hotel to hotel thinking, this is so weird. I've been in Israel so many times. I never get sick. Uh, maybe it's hotel food, but even when I try to eat some, any other food outside of the hotel, got me sick. I remember going to one hotel in the morning and was so happy. I saw rice. I'm like, oh my God, rice won't get me sick. This is perfect. So I remember I put the white rice. I didn't even leave. I was at the, it was a buffet. And I remember I didn't even walk back to my seat. I was so hungry. And I threw that rice in my mouth and I'm like, oh, finally. And then instantly I had to spit it out. I'm like, what is going on? So the Lord, now I know now forced me on a fast because, um, you know, I was with friends and, you know, we were sinning and all this stuff. And I, I think that's the reason why the Lord forced fast on me. And I, and also to make, you know, a clean vessel for what he was going to do in Jerusalem. So it was about the eighth or ninth day of the trip. We go to the Western wall, I'm 18 years old, I'm an atheist and we go to the Western wall and there's a bunch of people praying obviously at the wall. And I was in the middle of blaspheming God, straight up. I, I, was, I remember I was standing there with my friend, Mark, and 
I remember we, we were just talking and he was on my right. We were just talking and we, we, I think we went up to the wall for like two seconds and like, I kind of rolled my eyes. And like I went back again, I'm an atheist, like a self-righteous atheist. And I'm standing there with him and we're making fun of everyone praying at the wall, literally blaspheming God. I, I, rem I remember saying, wow, Mark, look at these idiots praying to a God that doesn't exist. and blaspheming god blaspheming his people making fun of them making fun of god and listen god in his glory in his beautiful mercy in his beautiful mercy and grace open up the heavens right after that came out of my mouth all of a sudden and i didn't know what it was i didn't know for 10 years what it was you know here i am telling this guy the story when i'm 28 10 years later of what happened to me when I was 18. And so me and my friend are standing at the Western wall blaspheming God. And all of a sudden it was like this liquid love fell over me. Like I felt it was just all over my head, all over my arms, through my legs. It wasn't just over me. It was in me. It was through me. I was full. I was full. <laughs> And, and, and I've said the story a few times to, to personal friends and they instantly felt the presence of God. So if you're feeling the presence of God, hallelujah, amen. Because um, that's just a witness to, to what happened. Oh, I was full and I was full of the most amazing emotions. Every single emotion that you can think of that's good and holy, you know, fruits of the spirit, beautiful, everything. I felt joy. I felt happiness. I felt euphoria. I felt pleasure. I felt everything amazing. I felt joy. I mean, joy unspeakable. Happiness unspeakable. The most amazing emotions. And the way that I would describe it is I would take all those amazing emotions and times it by 10,000. I don't know why I use that number, but actually it's so funny. I was listening to someone else's testimony kind of talk about some, something kind of similar. And they were talking about the presence of God and they're like, I times it by 10,000. That's so weird. I don't know why 10,000, but it's something, it's just, it's unbelievable. Imagine happiness and joy times it by 10,000. I don't know what it means. I it just, it, it's just, it, it was unbelievable what I felt. And it was, oh my gosh, it, I stood there, couldn't say a word. Again, him and I were in the midst of talking and we all of a sudden got real quiet. We were quiet for solid 45 minutes because this happened for 45 minutes. And I remember standing there, just staring at the wall, feeling the most amazing emotions and knowing a few things instantly, instantly. I knew in my spirit, this is home. What I'm feeling, this is home. This is where I'm meant to be. I don't know what I meant but I knew it was home. And I knew another thing. I knew that this is what heaven feels like 24 seven. I don't know how I knew again, I was an atheist. I know, I mean, I know it's the Lord revealing it to me, but I knew in my spirit that this is what heaven feels like 24 seven, no pain, no anxiety, no, no worries, no nothing. And I'm going to be honest with you. And I don't even know if I, should I say this Lord? You know, I, I was always petrified of taking drugs, always petrified, thank God. My parents instilled that in me um, for a long time. You know, I was always petrified of taking drugs. But I remember in high school, a um, little bit peer pressure, I remember I took a half a pill of E, half a pill, because I was afraid to overdose again. I was afraid to take the whole thing. And I, rem and, and the, and it, I kind of would describe it as, uh, you know, and like, I'm not telling anyone to do drugs or anything at all. Like, I wish I didn't do it, but it's the way that I can describe it. If anyone did take drugs, this is how it felt, but way more awesome and way more clear and way, I had no anxiety. My heart was not racing. It was like all the amazing emotions you feel on a drug, but it, drug, drugs are counterfeit of what I was feeling. Counterfeit. I knew in that moment, this is why drug addicts do drugs to get this feeling. Every spirit knows that God is real. They just deny it. And um, everyone, every spirit longs for God. Every spirit 
longs for the Holy Spirit. Every spirit longs for heaven, you know, eternity. Um, you know, they repress it and, 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 and all of that, to, you know, of the truth. They repress the truth. They want to live in their sin, but they want that their spirit wants to know the Lord. And um, I knew in that moment, this is what drug addicts are longing for. And I had a taste of it with, you know, when I, when I did what I did. And um, again, it was like 10,000. And I explained it as like 10,000 of what I was, you know, the counterfeit times that by 10,000, my heart was in racing and it was awesome. It was awesome. And at the same time, I started hearing this beautiful singing, really beautiful, loud. It was like 10,000, it was like 20, 30,000 voices around me. And, you know, again, this is 10 in the morning. I didn't drink. Um, I didn't, you know, I'm not on drugs, you know, I'm, I'm totally sober. Um, and I'm hearing those most amazing singing. It's like, ah, and it's everywhere around me. And I'm looking around, I'm thinking, who is singing? I hear it. I know what I'm hearing, but everyone's quiet. Everyone's praying at the wall. I don't know what, what's going on. And I remember at that moment is when I turned to Mark. I was afraid to ask Mark if he was experiencing the same thing, because I was afraid that he's going to think I'm insane. So I looked over to Mark. This is about, about five or 10 minutes into what's happening. And I turned to him and I said, um, I said, Mark, do you, do you hear that? He goes, Oh yeah. Do you feel that? What? You're experiencing the same thing. He's like, yes. What is it? And we just continue standing and staring there. Now, God, I know, you know, looking back on it, God mirrored to me what I, what was happening. So I knew that he was real. He mirrored, it was two witnesses, two witnesses to what he was doing. And I, I think it was also part of it was to remind me years later, like, remember, it wasn't just you. I, I mirrored to you with your friend. What, what happened wasn't, you weren't, you weren't sick. You know, you were fasting for five days, but you were totally sober and, and not sick. And this is real. What happened to you was real because someone else experienced it. And I remember like, whoa, I was just like, what? You're experiencing this too? And I, I, I kid you not, I, I, I could have stood there my whole entire life. When I tell you the most amazing emotions, knowing that this is what heaven feels like. And I also, um, I was so fully satisfied. So fully satisfied. Nothing in the world could come close to how I'm feeling in this moment in that moment. I was full. I was full. I was fully satisfied. I didn't need a thing. I could have stood there my whole entire life and been so happy and so content. And I could have literally stood there forever, forever and ever and ever. And, you know, knowing now what I knew, what, what, what I experienced, that's what heaven feels like 24 seven. We're, we are going to be there with the Lord. If we're, you know, if you're saved, you will, um, if you believe in Jesus and repent and follow him. Um, but you know, I'm sorry about all the beeping. I'm, you know, in New York, it's very loud. So, man, um, a few other things that I knew instantly, revelations from the Lord. Um, when I was hearing the singing, it was like, oh, it was like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of voices. I knew two things. I knew this is joy. I knew, it was such joy I was hearing, such joy. And the second thing I knew was eternal. This singing is eternal. I don't know why that word came to mind. I mean, I do, but at that time I didn't understand. I, I knew eternal, eternal, eternal. This never ends. This singing to the Lord, angel singing to the Lord will never end, ever end. It's forever and eternity, worshiping him, glorifying him, praising him in heaven. You know, the angels are doing it and also people, the saints, the saints that are saved. Um, so yeah, you know, what's funny, actually a few years ago, someone showed me, played me the, the audio tape of a choir of angels singing on tape. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I, I'm going to try to find it and list it down below in this video. So you can click on it. Someone played this for me. It's basically like a little choir singing a cappella. And they recorded themselves as they were singing a cappella, and then when they played it back, they th thought something was wrong with the tape because they heard 
they heard beautiful voices singing in, in a soprano that humans can't even sing. Not even Mariah Carey can hit that note. And it was, it was exactly what I heard. And what, actually when I heard it on tape, when I, when I heard it on the YouTube video, I was like, oh, I started crying because that was exactly similar to what I heard in Jerusalem. So again, full content. I knew this was heaven feels like. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to move a muscle when I was 18. I didn't want to move a muscle. I didn't want this to end. I could have stood there forever. Happy to stand there forever. I mean, nothing. I've never experienced joy like that. Never experienced joy like that. So anyway, 45 minutes go by. Maybe like 40, 35. My cat is deciding to scratch his post. Um, but anyway, so I, I, uh, I was so, I was bewildered by what is going on? What is this? So I remember I tiptoed over, like I tippy toed over to our tour guide. And this is the full, you know, this is the full story because sometimes I like cut this short, but I'm going to give you all the details. I tippy toed over to the tour guide, which again, I didn't even want to turn my back on the wall because I didn't want it to end. I wanted this experience to last forever and it will in Jesus name. But, um, you know, we're running the race. We're almost there. Um, and, uh, I tippy toed, tippy toed over to the tour guide and I said, Hey, uh, I don't know how to say this, but my friend and I were feeling things. We're experiencing things. We're hearing things. Um, it's really beautiful. We don't know what it is. Like, what is it? Do you, do you know what's going on? And he, his response was interesting. His response was, Oh, you guys are experiencing it too. Awesome. Again, this is a Jewish tour guide. And he's like, well, this happens ever so often. People experience this and hear and hear and hear this. What you're hearing and it, you're hearing, uh, you know, this, the remaining spirits of the Jews. So what? He said, you're hearing the Jews. Like, what do you mean? He said, well, in 1948, when there was Independence Day for Israel, all the Jews, you know, they ran to the Western Wall. They're all cheering and happy. And what you're hearing, it's like you're, you're tapping into that um, day and that joy and that excitement and that energy. And like you're, you're hearing, you're feeling it. And I was like, oh, okay. It, it made sense to me. I was like, okay. You know, it made total sense. So I kind of scratched it off as, well, I was just spiritually, you know, I kind of believed in ghosts a little bit. Um, but I was like, okay, it's probably some. Jewish ghosts running around, you know, singing and hallelujah. And I hear them <laughs> so stupid, but yeah. So I always thought it was that, that was my ex. That was the explanation. Again, it was a moment I never forgot. It was so profound. I, I never forgot it. And I always thought it was just, you know, Jews that I was hearing. And fast forward 10 years later, I'm telling the story to this friend and he goes, and he's laughing. <laughs> He's just hysterically laughing. He's like, really? He's like, you, you know, you haven't figured it out yet. Like, really, Anna? Um, you weren't hearing the Jews. You were feeling the Holy Spirit. You felt the glory of God. The heavens opened up. You felt the glory of God fully. You were full with his glory. And what you heard, and this is what did it. This line is what did it. He said, what you heard, you heard angels singing. He said, you heard angels singing. And as soon as he said that, as soon as he said that, I knew it. My spirit jumped and I got so excited and I knew what he was saying was the truth. I instantly dropped, in the, dropped on, down on my knees and I repented and I said, Jesus, you're real. <laughs> I am so sorry. I'm a sinner. Uh, forgive me. Cleanse me. I believe you. I repent. I want to follow you. I'm done. Like, I know you're real. I can't believe it took me this long. Like, I repent and I follow you, Lord. And in that same second, I felt all, I felt all of the burdens, all of the depression, all of the weights that were on my shoulders and on my back. I literally felt like it came off of me. I felt it lift off of me. As I'm on my knees, I literally felt it lift. I felt free. I felt clean. I felt new. I felt, I felt light. I felt joyful. I wasn't depressed anymore. It like gone. I was like, wow, wow, whoa, blew my mind. So testimony's not over. <laughs> 
So praise God, I'm saved. I'm born again. I don't know what that meant. I never read the Bible. I um, jumped on a plane to head home, to not head home. I was in New York. So I, from New York, I was in Nebraska now. And I was flying to visit my sister on the West Coast. I'm not going to say where she lives, but she lives on the West Coast. She doesn't like when I talk about her. She's very private. So if you're listening, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, babe. So anyway, so I fly to visit my sister's house and her husband and my nephews. And so here I am. This is like the day. It might, I think it was about, it was two days after I was saved. You know, again, I repented and saved in Nebraska. And I get on a flight. I got on a flight to head to my sister's house. And I am heading to the airport. And again, everything's just light. Everything's new. Everything's clean. I just feel so, ref I just feel like a brand new human being, which you are, you're a new creation in Jesus. And I, I was sitting in the taxi and here's a little other side note. I, at that time, was petrified of flying. Petrified of flying. Petrified. I would always go to, I would, first of all, I would never sleep the night before. I would be really exhausted so I could fall asleep on the flight because I would get really, really anxious flying. Um, I, I would always joke around and say, every flight takes a year off my life. Careful what you say. Um, you know, words have power. I didn't know that then, but well, I, first of all, I rebuke all those words I said in Jesus name, those have no power over me anymore, but I was petrified of flying very anxious. So I would get drunk when I got to the bar, um, you know, in the waiting room, I was said, but in the, um, in the, uh, in, in the, at the gates, I would go and I would drink, uh, like a triple Jack and Coke and like get really, really buzzed and like fall asleep on the plane. And once in a while, um, all right, kitty cat, meow, my cat. Um, and once in a while, I would actually have a Xanax, which I, again, I don't, I don't even take pills. I don't take Tylenol. I don't take Advil. Um, my friends, a few times, because I, I told them I have a long, long, long flight from New York, all the way to Nebraska, and then all the way to the other coast, and then I'm coming back across the other coast. I was freaking out, and my friend gave me a Xanax. And um, going to Nebraska, I took a quarter of a Xanax and knocked me out. Like I was knocked out, woke up, I was there. And anyway, so <laughs> so I, I I remember I was in the taxi cab after you know leaving Nebraska, I'm in a taxi cab, going to my my flight to visit my sister and I'm leaning to my, I'm leaning for my purse to take that little piece of Xanax to, to hit me so I can pass out on the plane. Like I don't even want to be on liftoff, like awake. So I reached for my purse and I heard it so clearly. I heard, don't take anything. You'll be fine. Just listen to me. Those three things clear. It's like, Ooh, who's that? Okay. Uh, I've never heard voices before, but I heard it so clear. And I said, okay, all right, I won't take anything. So I didn't take anything. I got to the gate. And again, I hate flying. So I was asking the lady at the gate if, uh, well, actually, when I was checking in, I was asking if they can move my seat up. I always ask, hey, can you move my seat up to the middle so I don't feel the turbulence? And it's like around the wings, it's really, it's not that turbulent. So here I am sitting, you know, here I am checking in, asking for a seat closer she said, sorry, um, there's six people on the waiting list. I, I cannot, I, I can't do anything for you. Sorry. I was like, okay, that's fine. So I get to the gate, I'm sitting at the gate. Um, I go ask the guy at the gate. I said, Hey, can you possibly move my seat up? I'm really terrified of flying. And the guy was like, uh, sorry. There was like six people on the waiting list. I'm sorry. You can't, but okay, fine. So I sit back down and I'm thinking, I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm about to get on a flight. I'm not taking any, like nothing's gonna knock me out. I'm not taking a Xanax, I'm you know, I'm freaking out. And I reached my purse again. I reached my purse again at the gate. And I heard very clear again, don't take anything. You'll be fine. Just listen to me. Interesting choice of words, you'll be fine. Because I used to always joke around with my friends. I used to always say, if my, you know, before I got on a flight, I'd always say, like, if my future self would just tell my past self, like, don't be afraid, you'll be fine. 
plane's gonna land, you'll be okay. Um, Cause it's my worst nightmare getting into a plane accident. Um, I thank God that Lord took that fear away from me. But you know, at that time I would always say that like, if my future self would tell my past self, I'll be fine. Like, don't worry, you'll be fine. Like I, I won't freak out. So this is, a, this is what I'm hearing. Don't take anything. You'll be fine. Just listen to me. Whoa, you'll be fine. Okay. Amen. So, so I'm boarding now. I have my boarding pass in my hand and I'm just, I'm freaking out <laughs> because I'm like, I'm getting on this flight sober. I hate flying. I'm just petrified. And I remember I give my boarding pass to the lady. Uh, she swipes me in and right when I give her my, I, you know, not my ID, but my boarding pass, I heard the voice again, very clear. I heard, ask again, like, ask again. I said, ask for the, f change my seat. And I'm like going back and forth with this voice. I'm like, ask again. Um, there's a six people waiting list. There's no way. And I heard, ask again. Okay. And I look over to her and I said, I'm really sorry. There's a long line behind me. You know, you're, you're boarding. Um, I have a long line behind me. And I said, I'm really sorry to bother you uh, last second, but do you possibly, can you possibly move my seat up? And she was like, oh, hold on a second. She was so nice. She's like, mm, da -da 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 on the computer. And she goes, actually, yes, we do have a seat available. So she moved me up to like the middle row. I think it was like row 17 or something, which is the date of my birthday. And uh, which is where I love to sit, 16, 17, around there. And I was shocked. I'm like, what? I just talked to that guy over there. There was a six people waiting list. Like, okay. So she moved me up. Okay. So I remember I plopped down in the seat. I was like in the center seat. <laughs> and, um, and I'm just sitting there. And I remember that voice. I remember that voice. Don't take anything. You'll be fine. Just listen to me. I'm literally sitting there. And I remember looking at my purse for the third time. And I'm like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I have, I'll be fine. I'm just going to listen. So I took off. And you know what? When, I, when we took off on that flight, I felt such peace. Like the Holy Spirit, I know now, was just flooded me. I was in such peace. I wasn't anxious. We took off. We were flying. And I remember just sitting there, sitting there quietly waiting. I know this as now is waiting on the Lord. I didn't know that then. But I stood there and I, I didn't have my headphones on. Um, I was just sitting, I, ha I remember I had my arms crossed and I'm just waiting, just totally waiting for that voice to, to talk to me. Cause the voice said, you'll be fine. Just listen to me. So I'm sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And it was about 15 minutes, 15 minutes into the flight. And I'm sitting and waiting again, no music, no headphones, just totally anticipating him speaking, which, yeah, which is so beautiful. Um, and all of a sudden it was like a download. It's like a download of information. Um, it was so much. <laughs> I heard, uh, actually most of it was from my brother, my brother-in-law. Your brother is ready to hear about me. Tell him about me. I'm thinking my brother, he's like a really big atheist. There's no, they're like, no, I'm like thinking there's no way. My brother is a massive atheist. Um, very stubborn <laughs> and an atheist. I love my brother. I'm really close to him. But, um, anyway, so, uh, so anyway, I hear the, I hear the voice saying, your brother is ready to hear about me. Tell him about me. Uh, I want him to read the Bible. I want you to, I want you to study the Bible. And I heard you and your boyfriend, who, the poker player I was dating, you and your boyfriend are going to break up in June. And this is March, 2000, 2016, March, 2016. And I hear you and your boyfriend are going to break up in June. And I heard a lot more other words. Let's just say that everything came to pass. Everything came to pass. And one of them is the Lord told me, uh, what my job, what, you know, what his will is for my life. It's private. So I'm going to keep that a secret. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was, it was a lot. Uh, it was a lot but it was beautiful and it was like, whoa. And everything came to pass because I'll tell you this, when I landed, the first thing my sister told me, she said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm starting to think that, you know, my husband is starting to believe in God. 
And that was the, the, the first word that I got. Your brother is ready to hear about me. He is ready to hear about me, tell him about me. And in, sure, in fact, when, when I, we got to his house, again, I was, first of all, I was crying on the flight the whole time because of not the heaviness of it, but it was just like, I, I, I was crying to Lord. I'm like, Lord, you picked the wrong seat. I, you're, you, you probably want the lady behind me because I can't do that. I don't know what this is. Like, this is, you picked the wrong person is what I was saying. <laughs> this is a lot. Um, you want me to do that? That's, that's, <sighs> what? You know, again, I'm a new Christian. I just found out that God is real. Um, it wasn't to the point where it was overwhelming, but I was, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. Um, just with the, which it, the whole time thinking, Oh my God, God is real. What? Um, and you know, I was crying cause I didn't want to break up with my boyfriend, even though we were having issues. I really didn't want to let him go. I really loved him. Every, everything I heard on that plane came true. When I landed at my sister's house, she told me, you know, my husband is starting to believe in God. I thought, whoa, wow, interesting. I got to their house. The first thing he tells me as I'm taking off my shoes in the hallway, he go, he screams and he goes, Anna, he screams across the kitchen. He's like, Anna, I have something to tell you. I think I'm starting to believe in God. What? I mean, I, I was like, not that I was shocked that this was coming true, but I, I was, I, I was shocked. It was all coming true. I was, I was just overwhelmed. Again, I'm a new baby Christian. It's like two days in. God was speaking to me and it's starting to roll out and play out. And again, I don't, I don't consider myself a prophet. The anoint, you know, God's Holy Spirit reveals all truth to us. And, but you know, we do, you know, we do prophesy sometimes and we do um, with the spirit of God. And praise the Lord. Um, anyway, so I, I, <laughs> in their house, I was exhausted. Again, I was crying the entire flight. I was crying the entire flight. I was just overwhelmed. I, I didn't want to break up with my boyfriend. I, I was just like, it was, it was pretty mess on that flight. And I remember the lady next to me, like, are you okay? Like, do you need a tissue? I'm like, oh, okay. And I was just, I was losing it. But, um, I'm exhausted and I don't want to, I, I was, I was like, Lord, I want to, can I tell them tomorrow? I really want to tell them tomorrow. I'm too tired tonight. And, but the Lord was like, Nope. And I had a rush of like new energy and I told them what happened. I told my brother, I said, he was like, yeah. And I'm starting to think I believe in God. I'm starting to think that God's real. And I said, well, he is real and you're never going to believe it. Um, I said, I told him what happened two days before. I told him what happened on the flight. I even wrote everything down on my phone because when this revelation was coming in, it was, it was, it was a lot. It was, it was like a download is the way I would describe it. And I didn't want to forget any, any of it. So I, I wrote everything down on my phone. So as I'm hearing what I was hearing, just things you're going to do, things I want you to tell, you know, what I want you to tell your sister, what I want you to tell this person, this and that, um, some parts of, you know, my what he wants to do with me. Um, and just all the, all of it came to pass, all of it, every single one of it again, except this one that I'm living in right now, that, um, part of his will for my life. Um, praise God, but everything came to pass. And here's, what's beautiful about this flight. <sighs> when that download stopped and I'm sitting on the flight and I'm again, I'm in tears and I am writing everything down. When I'm at the end of it all, you know, his, his voice st stopped talking. And I was just like, whoa. And I remember saying, well, God, I mean, this is, I, God, how do I know this is you speaking and not my own mind? Because I hear this voice clearly. I do believe in God now. You know, I'm not a schizophrenic. I've never heard voices before. And it was, it's so clear. And I just, I hear it so clearly as if somebody's whispering to me is how I heard everything, but it was in my mind. It was a very distinct voice. By the way, this voice that's speaking to me, you are going to do this. You are going to break up in June. You are going to do, I don't talk to myself in third person. I talk to myself. I say, I, me, what I'm going to do. I don't ever talk to myself 
and saying, you, you are going to do this. You're going to tell them this. You're going to do that. So it was a different voice. It was like a male, it was like a fatherly voice. And again, third person. So I was saying, God, how do I know this is you and not my own mind? And I heard so clearly, turn left. And I look left. And this woman that offered me a tissue before was reading, I'll never forget this book, which by the way, I've never found this book on Amazon. So I don't know if I was seeing something else or what, but she had this big, beautiful white book, white, with a beautiful gold rim around it. And the name of the book is The Whole Truth. That's the name of the book, The Whole Truth. Again, please find it on Amazon. If you ever find this book, send me a picture. Send me, a, I mean, I'll just buy myself a copy, but send me a picture of it because, whoa, I have never found that book. I've never seen it on Amazon um, ever. And it was, I knew, I, I was looking at it <laughs> and I'm looking at it and I'm like, the whole truth, okay. And I remember I look over back into the seat in front of me because that's where I was just sitting and staring. And I heard so clearly, what you are hearing is the whole truth. Wow. What you are hearing is the whole truth. And I knew it was God. I knew it was him. And um, I don't hear God often like that. I mean, that when I was just saved, it was all of this revelation. I've heard him a few times, three times I can count where I audibly heard him uh, in my mind. And, and then the one time uh, audibly outside of me when he wanted me to speak to a, a, a girl and uh, share my share share the testimony of God. I, I heard him like right as if he was like outside of here, telling me tell her tell her this and and I'll, I'll do a video on that testimony as well. It's a beautiful testimony. <clears throat> the Lord always thinks of His people even when they're just not even expecting it. He's always we're always in His heart. But yeah, so that's my testimony. <sighs> it's my testimony. Praise the Lord. What happened in Jerusalem? You know, when I saw my brother and I was telling him this, I said, the Lord wants you to read the Bible. First of all, actually, what I told him, I was like, yeah, um, God is real. And actually, you know, the Lord said that you're ready to hear about him. So let me tell you about him. And I told him what happened to me the past few days. And I told him what I heard on the plane. And I said, you're ready to hear about me. Tell him he's ready to hear about me. Tell him, tell him about me. And I wrote everything in my phone as it was happening. And I even showed it to him. Because if he, if he thought I was lying, the Lord, the Lord was brilliant enough to have me right under my phone because I said, if you don't believe me, here. And I gave him the phone and he was reading it. And it, again, like I said, there's a lot in there. So he was reading and he was like, how did you know this? Wait, how did you know about this? And it was obviously God, you know, I wouldn't know any, what, what the Lord revealed. It was just like his, his secret in his secrets in his heart. And my, my brother got saved. My sister got saved. Hallelujah. Um, praise God. Praise God. But that is my testimony. Praise the Lord. And I started reading the word. I started, I found a wonderful church, Times Square Church, Spiritual Church. Pastor Carter, who used to be Pastor, you know, Wilkerson. I, I didn't see him, obviously, when he was alive, but yeah, and the Lord um, has taken me to different trips, he, which I'll talk about as well. He took me on a trip to take Texas, where he, the second time he audibly spoke to me in 2017 after the hurricane. It's something I, I want to share as well. Should I share this now? No, I'll, I'll share this in another video. But yeah, the Lord is good. And you know what? Something, you want to have something funny. Last little side note. When the Lord told me, um, again, when, when I heard on the flight, you and your boyfriend are going to break up in June. I was like, no, I don't want to. I was crying on that flight. I was crying and I was like, no, we're not. You know, I don't want to. I was so upset. I, I remember it. So again, this is in March when this happened. And fast forward to June. I was on my best behavior. I was still dating that boyfriend. Um, again, I just started reading the Bible. Like I don't have any Christian friends. I had one Christian friend that I met who told me that, um, it's okay. You know, 
to live in sin, fornication, because the Bible's outdated. I had a friend tell me the Bible's outdated, which is dangerous. Whoa. Whoa. I still pray for her because I still think she thinks that. And I haven't actually addressed it with her yet because we don't really speak that much, but I will have to call her and tell her like, hey, no, it's not true. Uh, every word in the Bible is true. But anyway, and I, uh, I was, still, you know, I was still dating this guy and around June, I was on my best behavior. We were fighting like cats and dogs, cats and dogs. And I didn't want to break up with him because in, in, in my heart, I didn't want to let him go. And I didn't want that to come true. That was the one prophecy that was left over <laughs> in June that didn't come true yet. And I'm like, kind of arrogant. I'm like, Lord, like, I'm not gonna, yeah, everything happened. I, you're not going to win on this one. And I was like testing him and tempting him. I don't know what I was thinking. Don't tempt or test the Lord. And I was just like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Cause you know, he loves me. I'm his first love. He's not going to break up with me unless I do. So I'm not going to break up with him. It's not going to happen. Like this is not going to come true. And I was like, so arrogant, so dumb. And, um, he's so wonderful because I'm sure he was so patiently cause the Lord is patient, like laughing at me, like, yeah, you'll see. June comes around. I'm on my best behavior, trying not to fight. And we were still fighting in cats and dogs, but you know, just trying to keep it cool. The end of June comes around. It was either the last day of June or the day before the last day. Cause I remember it was the last days of June. I, I I'm telling you, I think it was the last day of June. I was shocked because, um, we had a fight and I left to go to another room. And I'm just, I know in my heart, we need to break up. Like, this is done. It's over. It's done. We can't be together. This is over. And, um, but I'm like, I'm not going to break up with him. I'm not going to do it. No, that's, it's not going to come true. You know? And all of a sudden that door opens and he barges in and he goes, Anna, I think we need to break up. We need to break up. Yeah. Yeah. We need to break up. It's over. It's done. It's over. And he closes the door and he leaves. And I'm just like, oh, what? I wasn't even, I wasn't even heartbroken that it was over because I knew in my heart it was over, but I was shocked that sure enough, every single thing I heard on that plane came true. Every little thing, every little word, every little, every word the Lord said came true. And to be really honest with you, you know, again, it took me some time to meet some solid Christians in the Lord who told me the Bible was true. But before I met any more Christians and before I really jumped into the word, we, we were, we, not that we got back together. We were, you know, we, I saw, we saw each other every few months, right? I was traveling a lot for another job. And, um, what's funny and ironic is that we kind of quasi got back together and we broke up again for the final time the next June. Um, so not only did we break up in June, and I was like, no, Lord, we're not going to break up in June. We broke up in June twice. So when you try to battle the Lord, you're not going to win. He's going to win. Don't, don't, don't even tempt him. Don't even battle him. Don't even just, just yes and amen, Lord, because he knows what's best for you. He knew what was best for me. And that was not a good relationship. He's a great guy, great family, but not, first of all, we're supposed to be equally yoked. He's still an atheist. He's a liberal. I'm a, you know, born again, Christian conservative. And we are to be equally yoked spiritually. It's so important. And we were not it. But anyway, the point is, is that the Lord was like, really, you don't want my prophecy to come. You don't want that word to come true. Well, it's going to come true twice. How about that, Anna? And, and it's like, um, I, I don't know, you know, I'm sure you people are, I, I don't know if many people are aware, but the Lord has a sense of humor. I've learned that in my walk. He's got a sense of humor. He's funny. He's patient. He's, his loving kindness endures forever. And he's so patient with us. And I was, I, you know, had, had stubborn moments. I, I know we all do. And, um, he's like, he likes to laugh at us, you know, he's like, okay, really? Um, yeah. Like as I'm blaspheming God, he's just like, really, honey, you don't know me yet here. Let me pour out my Holy spirit on you. Oh, really? You don't think this is going to come true? I'm going to let it'll come true twice for you to show you that I'm sovereign, that I'm omnipotent, that I'm not a liar, that I'm the, tr I'm the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. 
and that this is the truth. I am, you know, that Jesus is the truth. And my whole life changed. Again, my depression left. Um, the Lord told me what some of the things he wants me to do. And he totally guided me through, you know, where I am now. And um, yeah, that's my, t that's the testimony. That's my testimony and I'm sticking to it. And um, God is good. He's real. Jesus is real. He died on the cross for your sins, whether you believe him or not. He died for you because he loves you. He died for us while we were yet still sinners. And this is your day to day. Who's ever watching this who's not a believer I'm talking to you? And I'm talking to you with love, not condemnation, with love, not judgment, but with love. That. You know, I was an atheist for my most of my life. And I was living in darkness. I didn't see I was stumbling and falling. But God is good. God is light. And he, his burden is light. When he took that heavy burden off of me, he put on a light, beautiful necklace of truth and garment of grace on my head. And um, tomorrow's not promised. Tomorrow is not promised not you might go to sleep tonight and you might not wake up you might not don't wait if this testimony touched you just ask him ask him like I did ask him God are you real if you're real I want to know you that's what I did I said God are you real I'm starting to think so if you are show me prove it you're God Almighty Prove it. Surely you can do that. I didn't ask him mockingly. I didn't ask him sarcastically. I asked him with all of my heart. I poured my heart out on that floor. I was on my knees crying, pouring out my heart. Lord, show me you're real. Are you real? Please do. If you're real, show me. And I wait again, two weeks. I was like, oh, I was totally expecting him to talk because I really thought he was. And he did in a mighty way reminding me what happened to me in Jerusalem 10 years before that, you know, the teacher, uh, what's that beautiful, uh, like little, uh, I think it's like a Japanese proverb, but when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So I was ready. I had my ears open for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. I had my ears open and he sent a messenger to, to tell me and, um, tell me I was silly for not realizing it before. And I did waste a lot of time and it's, Part of my part of my life part of my testimony um so uh praise god yeah tomorrow's not promised so just ask god are you real if you're real show me real because he will mean it with all of your heart seek and you shall find knock and the door will be open open to you ask and those answers will be given to you i implore you to give him a shot what do you have to lose if you're living in depression like I was, what do you have to lose? If you're living in darkness and shame, what do you have to lose? I was, by the way, last thing I'm going to say is this. God wants to reach everyone and he knocks on everybody's heart. He knocks on everybody's door. And sometimes, depends on the person, he has to get to different people differently. Uh, you know, with a lot of people in the Middle East, it's dreams. He's giving an abundance of dreams in the Middle East because they, they know that dreams come from the Lord. Um, with prideful people like I was, I was like, so like, God's not real. Um, he had to humble me. He had to break me. And, you know, obviously it's not him, you know, break, it's the devil breaking me, but he was allowing it because he needed me broken to the point where I was left alone with no one to lean on, not even myself. And I cried out and I, in the moment of just like brokenness and I have no one else around me, I have, I, don't, I have nobody. I don't have a lot of friends. You know, I'm living in Jersey away from my family. I don't, you know, I was just alone and I cried out. So the Lord, the more stubborn you, the more stubborn you are, the harder, like not even the harder, but you're going to have to go through some stuff to, to you know, to, to, to find him. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but like for me, it was, I was arrogant and prideful and the Lord had to break me down. So just be open-minded, avoid that roughness, that hardness of, you know, that, 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 that tough 
path to get to him. I just implore you just to have an open heart and open mind and just say, Lord, are you real? Show me your real because he will show you he's real. He's real. He's God almighty, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. If you have an open heart, ears to hear, he will let you hear. He will send someone to you or you're watching this right now because he wants to talk to you. So I just say, Jesus, you know, I, I believe you're real. I believe you died on the cross. I repent for my sins. And I invite you into my life, into my heart. I invite the Holy Spirit to live within me, to wash me, to make me new, to forgive me of all of my sins. And he will. Because he's full of mercy, full of grace, full of justice. He's full of justice, but he's also full of grace and mercy. And he will forgive you. He's just to forgive you of all of your sins if you believe and accept Jesus and follow him. Not just believe in him, but follow him. Follow him daily, every day. Pick up your cross and follow him. Sometimes it's not easy, and sometimes it is. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a walk that you walk through. My kitty cat, hold on, bubby. It's a walk that we go through. Um, and the more you fall in love with him, the easier it becomes. Like this life is, is gonna be full of persecution. Jesus promised us he was persecuted. But uh, when you're walking in love and in a relationship with God, as opposed to religion, tradition, it's freedom. It's straight up freedom for those who uh, know him. You know, he sets you free. So you know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen, hallelujah testimony finally filmed it um praise god uh amen i i bless every one of you in jesus name may the peace of the lord be upon you seek him seek him you will find him you will find him he's there waiting for you so just keep knocking keep searching for him jesus loves you i love you god bless you and join uh our monday and wednesday tea time and bible study live on Periscope, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'll see you there. Love you guys. God bless you.